So we'll get started here. The whole point of this was we spent the last few weeks talking about like, what are we going to do, you know, for training? You know, how long is this going to last and how are we going to keep everybody in shape? So that was along the lines of what we spoke about in the last few weeks and just seeing how everybody's doing. And I'm obviously I'm uh, concerned about staying in touch with people and, and seeing how they're doing. And what I want to talk about today is, you know, without looking too far ahead, um, and I think one of the first things I want to talk about is what is coming back look like? So if there's a return to sport, what the hell does that look like? Is it sort of like, okay, let's business as usual. Cause I don't think that's going to happen. Even everything that I'm hearing about worrying about reoccurrences and outbreaks happening again, getting people together as fans, as teams for training camp, all that sort of thing is going to look way different. And it's going to be some sort of phased monitored approach. And, you know, if you want to talk about monitoring in sports, well, here's a good one to start with, right? So uh, GPS isn't going to de detect the virus and force planes aren't going to detect the virus. So what is going to happen as part of this return to sport? Is there going to be some sort of small group training initially? Is there going to be meetings all done by uh, Zoom or, or whatever for team meetings? Um, how do people get treatment? How do people get uh, physical therapy if they get injured? Uh, what does that look like? So all these things, I mean, that's what I want to talk to, but then let's talk about, you know, even the training itself. So I'm going to call on a few people here to get us started. I'll, I'm going to start with Keenan Robinson because he always has some great things to say and he's kind of in the thick of it and he did some planning this week already in terms of what does the return look like. And so, and then we'll just go through there and I have different questions and different issues I want to address. And hopefully we can do this in 90 minutes without taking too much of your time. Okay. So we'll start with Keenan. If you want to unmute yourself, Keenan, and just kind of dive into, you don't have to give us all the gritty details, but certainly some of the questions that you're trying to answer with your staff and, and your athletes right now. Well, you, you teed us off really nice, Derek, in terms of there's the, there's the actual athlete return in terms of, and I hate saying this, you know, like the load management, because people just think it's just a generic thing. And anyways, it's not the topic of this conversation, but also just the human interaction. Um, it will be interesting to hear Rob's perspective being in NYC, but yeah, we, we may see a reduction in, in cases, but I mean, the reality is until this, this disease is not going to go away. Uh, so when we have that dramatic drop in cases showing up, what does it look like intelligently in terms of reintegration? Because as soon as, as we've learned, like when this, when this disease catches on, it spreads quickly, right? So I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it means vaccine first and then we can start to integrate people once the vaccine comes. And if that's the case, uh, this April 28th, 30th date probably seems a little bit shorter than what we're really uh, intelligently deciding. So I think, when it comes to, to each sport's going to be different, but I do think it's going to come like the non-essential aspects of sport in terms of non-essential human uh, interaction, face-to-face -face human interaction. So like the, it will be interesting, like, right. Like will, will professional sports do meetings and video reviews and all those things from, from a zoom, uh, you know, we're hearing like people can, can like pirate their way into these zoom meetings and whatever. So, right. Like, uh, whatever I, the Patriots are, they going to have like the Zoom like break in, so they're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't pass it by them, right? And then um, you know treatments, and, and we we hope that treatments can be done on a minimal basis because this has been like the first time that everybody, coaches, athletes, um, everybody involved with the actual training and gameplay are going to really have to consider like, how do you load up uh, the human body? And so those that have been doing it already intelligently for years and years and years are like, well, that's, that's fine. And that's kind of what you were alluding to Derek, as we, we sat down uh, this week uh, and looking at what is, what is the, what does literature say about detraining? So absolutely cessation of activity. And I, I don't know, I think, I think America, I'm sure Canada is the same way. Like no one has actually activity has increased right? Like everybody purchased every home piece of home, home equipment possible. And so everything is, is ramped up. So detraining not necessarily has occurred. Specific, specificity detraining has occurred. And I think that's where 
on an individual basis, highly intelligent, well thought out coaches and whatever we're considered, the, the ancillary staff, we're fine, right? We're just gonna be like, all right, this is, this is what we do. Um, then the cross training aspect of it, what does that look like? Um, are we, have we been making recommendations to our athletes uh, on a in an intelligent manner on, on cross training? So uh, I think, you, you know, you look at your different um, storage units or buckets or whatever the heck you want to call them, right? So you have your physiology storage units. And so what energy systems have you been working on during this cross training that, that, that go over to your sport of performance? Um, musculoskeletal uh, storage unit, what, what musculoskeletal things have you been doing? Uh, neurological and so on and so on. And then so the re-education, like you go back and say, okay, come to me real, like how much did you actually stop doing activities? Okay, then you fall into this and we go this route. We, we built out this cross training. So um, at this point in time, we can estimate uh, this amount of percentage has been lost. So we, we add it back in from this percentage on. But, um, you know, I think within the last 48 hours, the, 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 the bigger topic is like, when can we actually, as a society, integrate again? So that's, that's what I'm actually interested to hear what people's thoughts are on that. Yeah. And obviously, there's a difference between sort of like the team sport dynamic and training and the specificity you talked about um, versus say like you could still probably put people in the pool and separate them and get them to do their workout as they normally would probably just not as economically in terms of having as many people on site and I think that's you know I'm going to talk to Mike Hurst and I think that's what they're looking at right now is small groups and but it certainly we'll get into the the team training the the footballs the basketballs you know like yeah but to that note it's it's like the whole the the like the the running sports the swimming sports they're they're because of the nature of their training they become immunocompromised like their immune system sure. it's right so uh man it, it does it does scare me a little bit that that uh it's that's not a consideration you're like well as long as we separate them by you know six feet or whatever and we don't let the, the public come in it's just me the coach and the four best athletes and we train them we keep going it does not mean that like when they get out and they come in contact with society that they're not going to run the risk of like, why, sure. why the first three weeks of every at least university, the NC2A, that's where our highest uptick is in upper respiratory infections and mononucleosis and like, because they're immunocompromised and they're playing flip cup and whatever on the weekend, like the, the same rules apply. Like just because you've isolated doesn't mean when you get back out, unless they're going to put them in those like bubble things that like, you know, those big bubbles that people can like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we'll do. Uh, but anyways, I'll stop now. Oh, well, thank, thank you for that, Keenan. Certainly a lot to think about. Mike Hurst, um, you're on the running side. You guys are looking at doing some small group stuff. Um, How is that looking and what precautions are you taking? Um, maximum of two per repetition uh, in groups of two working more on duration and density rather than high intensity, uh, taking longer, eh, maybe not taking longer to recover, trying to keep the, that, that density level going and build a, a general base, rebuild a general base. We've had a month off. I've had two sessions so far. I've got another one this morning. So small groups, very small groups and keeping social distancing recommended at 1.5 meters. But when athletes are huffing and puffing and having a look at the, uh, the Belgian study uh, on air circulation, aerosol circulation, I'm using about 20 meters to try and be on the edge of being safe. Having said that, I'd like to think that the athletes are fit enough uh, and not having any breathing problems to suggest that they are not contaminated with the virus, but who knows? That's about all I'm doing at the moment. Yeah, that 20 meters seems safe. I've, there's been some literature on safe distances for running, cycling, and just the, the spread of the, the droplets can be more profound if you're you know, running around and moving around. So that sounds smart. What's, what's coming from above in terms of administration saying like, are they giving you these guidelines or are you kind of self-imposing them? What, you know, how... I'm self-imposing, self speaking for yeah. my group. Yeah. I saw some other prominent groups that were not observing anything like 
the distancing and they were mingling together at the end of reps, end of sets. And even though they were running with good distance when they're actually running, it, it, it all gets undone as soon as, the, the, as the, they, they finish across the finish line and all start to co-mingle. Doesn't make any sense to me. It's inconsistent. Uh, in terms of direction, uh, there is no direction. The, 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 I've spoke to some people, I won't say who, but the, the formal advice was, it, it's way out of date, you know, restrict your groups to, to, to no more than 10 per, per, per run. Well, that, that was written quite a while ago, obviously. So I rang up somebody and his advice was, listen, I can't tell you to go out and train, but we know everybody is. And a lot of places like in China and Sweden and other places uh, are actually training the house down. Um, so they're not going to miss a beat really. They, they've, they've quarantined entire campuses and they're getting, getting on with the job. We don't have that luxury here. All of our facilities are locked down. All the gyms are locked down. The private gyms are banned at the moment. But um, <clears throat> pro sports are, are rumbling and the NRL that I said last week was looking for a June return to competition have now fixed May the 28th for a return to competition. That's the biggest football league in Australia outside of uh, AFL, which is yeah, aerial ping pong. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Mike. I, I, you know, I, I wish there was more coming from above so that people had some standards around this, but you know, we're just relying on you know, smart people to do it on their own, I guess, smart coaches. And I don't know if there's enough of those smart coaches. I wanted to kind of jump to like Tyrone and Ryan are talking about this idea of testing. Now, sport testing has always been a big issue, but now this testing of how do we actually test our teams and have a recurring testing program to make sure people are staying healthy. Um, do you have, we'll have some thoughts on that, Tyrone, and then we'll jump to Ryan Banta. Okay. Oops, sorry. There the, you go. Sorry, my understanding of the testing right now is that, first of all, you can still test negative uh, for COVID even though you're positive, and there's, there's a there's – a, basically a not very clear um, false negative rate that's pretty high. So even if, you're, if, if you've got people testing negative, um, it's not a guarantee that those people are negative. And, um, you know, it's problematic uh, to be ha saying, hey, we're gonna get back to work. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be testing pro athletes, even though in many parts of the country, you know, people aren't able to get tests for themselves, right? Um, now, it depends on the country, depends on the culture there, all those things. <laughs> But I don't think it's a very good look for a pro sports league to be prioritizing its pro athletes over the general public in a pandemic situation. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think that people are being very careful of their long-term brands, the smarter organizations are, and they're not going to make any stupid moves. You know, if you're looking for stupidity, look at UFC. But if you're looking for like long-term brand safety, I think you look at like the NBA, who was the most, he was really the people who started this off. Uh, the NHL and uh, Major League Baseball, I don't see any crazy, I don't see any quick moves to come back. Yeah, you would think there's, there's huge liability uh, involved in like, they come back early, people get sick, somebody dies, you know, or somebody gets impaired, you know, there's going to be a lawsuit around that and guess, you know, they're going to sue the richest people, right? So um, I think that that's something that sticks in my head, especially from a player union point of view. Ryan? Uh, what are your thoughts on on testing, even at the school level? Like if you bring kids back together in schools, how are we going to determine whether or not that's safe? Obviously, you know, this is a pandemic and this is an issue in regards to, you know, global health. And I mean, we've, we've already stated that and we've beaten that topic up for the last three or four weeks that you and I and the rest of us have gotten together. If we're looking at coming back, they're going to be the same questions that we have now will be the same questions we have three months from now. It's always that thing where who's the first one who's going to take the risk. You know, when we talk about guaranteed money, right? The NFL has the least amount of guaranteed money of any of these sports. NBA and baseball have a ton of 
you know, guaranteed money. So obviously, you know, and we talk about brands, you know, in a sport like professional football where we got women getting beat up all the time and drugs and guns and all this kind of stuff. You know, I don't know that they're all that concerned about their brand versus how much money they bring in every year. When we ignore CTE and steroid abuse and whatever. So what I think is going to happen when it happens is that they're going to bring everybody back and they're going to start testing them. And then they're going to have a 21 day period where these guys get tested every day. Now, as Tyrone and I talked on chat here, my thought is, is that they're going to wait till we get enough tests where basically there isn't one random doctor in one random town saying that we have no tests and no equipment. And, you know, that conversation disappears. So we're still a couple months away. And the NFL season is many months away in terms of gameplay. So I think it's going to be a 21-day period. They'll test all the athletes every day. Baseball floated the idea of – bringing everybody into a zone and playing their wet, their conference play in the same city or same area where they have a lot of stadiums. So they would do it like the Grapefruit League and, and have one group play here and everybody plays in the same town um, so that at least you get the revenue of TV revenue and you have different teams and different stars playing against each other. Um, and they're just not moving very much. They're all staying in the same encampments, they're staying in the same hotels or stadiums or facilities they're playing against each other without crowds um that's kind of where i think we're probably going to go first with school who knows you know in america because you know the president that we currently have is allowing governors and local authorities to make the decision on when and where things are going to come back and what that's going to look like we right now are under the thought process that we're not going to be allowed to train any of our kids or coach any of our kids until the very first day of school, which will be late August in Missouri. So, um, you know, we're still looking at a couple months away, but at some point you're going to have enough tests. You're going to have enough combination of drugs that are going to work to treat it. Once you get it, the virus is not going to burn itself out because it's just going to magically go away, but it's going to burn itself out because a lot of people are eventually going to get either sick and die or they're going to get sick and they're going to get the antibodies. And then, you know, another year from now, we'll eventually have a vaccine, but there will be sports next year and we will have school next year. It won't all be electronic and, but it's going to look a little bit different and we're going to be a lot more cautious. And I think that if people are smart because they have time before the NFL season has to start and NCAA has to start again, you can implement some things to be proactive and protect yourself and be a little bit smarter about how you get it done. In pro sports, it's going to be much easier than the NCAA. I would say pro comes back before college does. Yeah, I mean, it brings up this whole idea of like, hey, we bring pro sports back. Do we put them in a hotel for the entire season, right? right. They're not allowed to go home and interact with other people and, you know, possibly infect the team, right? Because as soon as you infect a team, that team's off off the radar they're they're gone right so right you know it's it's you know it's like a survivor game but um thanks thanks for that ryan um the herd immunity thing is interesting there was a hong kong doctor who was basically saying that uh the herd immunity or the vaccine route either way is going to take a long time anyways like a year year and a half so i wanted to get uh, rob panarello to jump in we we're having a discussion earlier a bit about the financial uh influence of all of this like you know people expect to get paid, you know, they want money. Um, is that going to influence things before health, Rob, in your opinion? Do you think that's going to, is there going to be a conflict there in terms of return to sport and universities trying to, you know, you know, make revenue, have people come back to school, make the revenue, go on residence, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, pro teams in terms of getting viewership and, and sponsorship and all that. What, what are your thoughts on the, the money piece? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, a couple of things. You just, it is the balance between avoiding an economic, I'm talking about a national or a world economic disaster and the health of people, right? That seems to be, when is the time we're going to let, um, you know, life as it was prior to the virus initiate those processes to begin again, right? And I don't know if people know. What we know is if you look at New York, you know, and you look at New Orleans with Mardi Gras and things like that, these highly dense areas are the ones that are most apt to spread the virus, right? You have a lot of people in a small area and, 
and it spreads. I mean, if you have a college football team, it's not going to be practical to train people like Mike is training them two at a time. It's just not going to happen. Um, you know, and it's not just the athletes, right? What about the guy that's cleaning the locker room? What about the umpires that are calling the game? How do you quarantine them? They're not going to be allowed to go home. They're going to stay in hotels the whole season as well. And so it's, it's, um, it's not an easy, it's not an easy decision. I, I you know, I don't know when the, where they're going to, you know, loosen up the reins for things to occur. Um, you know, I have a friend of mine, Derek, and you visited me in New York. I mean, I, I have a, I have a summer home out East and we're about to open up the pool, things like that. And I, and I, I asked, I asked Keenan, you know, with bodily fluids and this and that, and the other thing is, a, is someone asked me, you think a pool will be a Petri dish for this thing, right? Because it's warm, you have sweating, you have saliva going into the pool. You know, what happens there with swim teams and things like that? Never thought of that. So um, it is going to be a balance between economic disasters and health disasters. You know, when do we start to get back to normalcy? I wish I had that answer. If I did, I'd probably be president or anybody be president. The other thing that that people may 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 not be aware of, and um, I forget the legal term, but there is a term in law that essentially with an act of God, um, you can make adjustments on contracts with regards to, we're going through this in our own company and many other companies. If you look at, uh, there was an article yesterday in Sports Illustrated how a, uh, a part-time, very well-known writer refused to take a pay cut when everybody else at Sports Illustrated was, and so they terminated him. Right, they didn't think he was of the appropriate culture for Sports Illustrated. I was watching ESPN this morning, and commissioner of the Big Twelve is taking a twenty percent pay cut, and the rest of the commission, the rest of the people in the Big Twelve, they're taking a ten percent pay cut. So there are there are adjustments occurring for survival of the organization. And again, I'm I'm growing a blank on the term, but with an act of God, so to speak, there there is things where you could be limited in paying your bills or honoring contracts that occur to employees and not be held liable to that contract, you know, so that the organization survives. And um, it's going to be interesting what goes on with this. I think, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that you're going to have to keep training people and, you know, whether it's like Mike is doing it, whether it's their own environment, whether it's maintaining their GPP and then trying to enhance some type of physical quality due to limitations, if it's a body weight series because no equipment's available to them or they have their own home gym or anything in between. But how do you, you know, how do you determine when it's ethically, if you want to use that word, appropriate to put people at risk due to resuming the economics of a, of a country, of the world. And I certainly don't have that answer. You know, they say that we're supposed to get some antibody, accurate antibody testing, you know, as before was stated, and forgive me, I think it was Tyrone, you know, a lot of false positives that may be true. And supposedly we're coming out with these, these tests they are going to test for antibodies within five minutes by the end of this month. We'll see, you know, but I don't know. Yeah. It would certainly be, I think, prudent for the sports pro sports leagues maybe the ncaa once this is uh, approved these tests like to, to stock up on them and have them at their facilities and be doing testing to not only obviously to do the right thing ethically but to prove confidence don't you think in terms of like yeah, i do but when somebody tests positive is it too late <laughs> yeah how long have they been circulating and, and I agree with Ryan. I think that the pro leagues or you know power five conferences the people that have the um, the TV revenue contracts, because even if they play in empty stadiums, they're going to achieve re revenue because of telecast, right? So I agree with Ryan. I guess if the pro if the teams that have those situations, those are probably the ones that come back first, because they'll generate revenue in front of an empty in an empty stadium, right? Because they're still developing some kind of revenue. I said this last week. 
I'm more concerned with, uh, I want to see what happens with the small universities, right? Or, or situations where, because the stock market is so, is fluctuating so much, what's happening to their endowments? And if they're not making money on the endowment and they had to return, um, you know, revenues with regards to room and board because students went home early and they don't have a TV contract and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of stress of the finances on those smaller schools and, you know, what's going to happen to their sports next year. So a lot of schools are not allowing, uh, you know, seniors this year come back with scholarship because of the added expense. And so I know the whole thing is, it's a big question mark. I, I really, I'm just sitting back and watching what's going on. I certainly don't have the answers. Yeah. I, um, you know, I even wonder if some universities are thinking, well, we were kind of borderline with some teams. Why don't we cut some sports now? This seems like a good time, right? You know, I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but, you know, we'll see, especially football, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to get Ken Vick to jump in to, to talk a lot about the business side, too. We talked about that last week. But when you get the green light to have people in your facilities, Ken, what are some of the things you're going to focus on knowing that maybe they're going to have a competitive season coming up and maybe it's two weeks, maybe it maybe have them for three weeks. I don't know what that number is, but what are you, what are you looking at in terms of options? Yeah, it's uh, interesting. So we're sitting around trying to figure out those things right now. Um, for us, it kind of breaks down. We got individuals we work with organizations. So in centers, uh, we got primarily at velocity. It's youth recreational athletes. We have our places that have pros. Uh, so what are we thinking about? Um, on our pro athletes, we're kind of looking at how people are in different sports, and we're thinking about this like a return to performance after injury situation, um, more from a service standpoint. Um, you know, what are we going to be delivering as a service? So we're expecting to go small groups uh, across the board for everything we do. First openings are going to be small group. Well, first openings might be one-on-one, -on -one, in all honesty, then small group, uh, keeping size, distance, other things in place. Uh, we expect there will be things being promoted around tracking. Uh, you guys are pricing stuff from Apple and Google and Android. They're working on tracking devices, who's been tested, who's got stuff. We expect some things will be coming into the public realm. No idea what they are, um, but we're going to have to do something with them, right? So our businesses are kind of going, okay, what's that going to look like? Are we going to be, the big question on the private side for us is what is our responsibility and restriction going to be? It's going to vary by state, um, but what's our responsibility going to do on things that aren't clear legally, but the ethical question, right? Um, you guys said it too. It's about a brand. The big brands, the big sports brands, leagues, teams care about that brand. Um, every business owner cares about their brand. So yeah, you got to make money. On the one side, you want to survive because you don't have a brand if you're not open. Uh, but on the other side, we want to do the right thing. So a lot of questions. Uh, and we're, again, we're, we're, you know, we're mixing the business side, what we're trying to think about with what's going to train, change on the training side. Uh, our pro and Olympic athletes are in different boats. Uh, our pro guys, man, they're, there could be, there's going to be some leagues that take it nice and slow. And there's other ones that are going to be under big pressure to perform quickly. Uh, it was mentioned before, like by Keenan, the, the D training is going to be specific to different systems. Our sprint sport athletes, boy, we're, we're worried if people don't do a good thing when they go, go back to their teams. Um, our contact sport athletes, yeah, there's going to be, we're, we're thinking about treating this like a return to sports situation. Pretend like in our mind, everybody was hurt. What do we need to get them back? Uh, yeah, she's um, especially for a private business, understanding that balance between the finances and the ethics and, and then the training, right? Like, okay, well, what do we prioritize here, given that we only have a little bit of time and there's pressure on this sport or there's pressure on, you know, you know, we got to get them back and we got to start making money and putting, well, butts in the seats, whether that's TV revenue. So that's, that's huge. Thanks for that, Ken. Um, I wanted to jump back to more, again, the physical therapy side. And if you're a physical therapist, I'll, I'll get back to Rob, but we'll get Eric Marriott in here. Um, if you're a physical therapist and you're anticipating that there's going to be injuries, what can you do proactively um, to make sure that your clients, the people, if you're working with a team, Eric, 
what are you telling them? What are you preparing for right now in terms of like, okay, injury resiliency is the most important thing right now when we come back. Cause we know there's going to be some sort of specific detraining is, is uh, both Ken and uh, Keenan talked about. What are you looking at there, Eric, in terms of your role as a physical therapist and advising on the injuries? Yeah, I think on the main thing for me personally right now is just to manage expectations with the athletes, you know, making sure that they have a clear understanding of that, that, um, you know, what, what is expected in terms of how fast and how intensely they're going to return to activity in relation to what they're doing now and just making sure they're as keyed into that as they possibly can be. To me, that is like the biggest thing, because if I think if they internalize that, understand that and understand that this, this potential progression when we come back is really what's actually going to keep them in the game and competing and competitive as long as possible. That's the most significant thing. And then, you know, I've got a number of people I'm still working with right now and, and we're taking it as an opportunity to work on the things that we never get an opportunity to work on the things that, that because they're in season, because they're competitively training and whatnot, that there's certain qualities and movement qualities that never get looked at or are always lowest on the totem pole. Um, and, and I think we could identify some of those as potentially things that make them more resilient when they come back too, because they've always been living in this like, you know, reduced buffer zone that, that, therapy and treatments and all these things with keeping them healthy in but but now we have a chance to potentially open that up and use that within our advantage when they actually get back into training um so I mean, there's a couple of ideas that i've been i've been thinking about right now and to me managing the expectations is is by and far the most important thing yeah that's a good point is is anybody who's expecting to return to what we were uh like you know five months ago three months ago is is probably not thinking right you know, like it's going to oh, yeah. be different. I, I think, I think I work with a lot of like youth athletes. And so, you know, trying to help them gain a perspective on it is, is interesting because yeah, they're, they're living day to day. Like uh, they, they're not necessarily looking at their, their season coming up in August, September. Um, and just in that world, the balance between what sport coaches, you know, uh, strength and other coaches, and then me are all prescribing is often so potentially disparate anyways. And the person that really needs to understand it is the athlete. Um, and so trying to get as many of those ducks in a row right now too, has been interesting because I've got sport coaches that I'm sort of collaborating with who are still giving their athletes things to do. And I'm trying to do the same. Uh, but normally we, we have a really, we have a challenge trying to coordinate those at times because of, you know, there's all these people involved. Uh, but now people have got, you know, there's this perception that someone has time. And so that's been the other thing that we're trying more than ever to become really coordinated in those endeavors. Um, and, and hopefully that plays dividends when we come back is that that coordination, that understanding just sort of, continues yeah no thanks for those uh thoughts there eric i I think the expectation piece is huge and uh rob i wanted you to jump in on the injury piece as well the injury mitigation um but also sorry uh sorry i just keep (laughs) i'll get you there there um but also how how are you anticipating that you're going to be treating people you know so say you come back you know what's the distancing what's the you know what's the admission how, well, you know, is that something you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, we are, we are treating people. Our facilities are open. We are treating people. Are okay. still having some, people are still having some surgeries, believe it or not. And so, you know, our people in gloves and masks, we have, uh, you know, social distancing. Um, people that come into our facilities, they fill out a subjective questionnaire. Their temperature is taken. And if we have any suspect, suspicion that they may be carrying the virus, they're told to leave and contact their physician. Otherwise, we treat them between every treatment session. Hands are washed. Tables and equipment are washed down. It's very tedious. Um, you know, so the physical aspect of actually treating, we're doing that. We're, probably, we're doing more and more telehealth visits every day due to the concern of patients um, and others. Um, and so that's that's going on. As far as what I anticipate, um, listen, I think, I think people are, I think people are all going to be in the same boat. And I think a lot of it's going to come down to 
obviously their condition going back to return to sport and then how the coaches treat them in return to sport. Is there going to be an adjustment in the progression to prepare them or is it going to be gangbusters day one, right? I think that um, the nervous system is the nervous system to me. You know, as Ken said, he's going to look at it as people's return to play. I, I agree with him, but the nervous system is the nervous system, right? We don't have one nervous system to play golf, one to play soccer, one to play baseball, one to play football, etc. And so I just think you prepare the body as best as the way you prepare the body. And I just think that you have to get their work capacity in whatever way you can, the work capacity levels up to what's acceptable, what you deem as close to acceptable, because one, they have to produce maximal efforts repeatedly over time, and they have to recover from those maximal efforts in practice, so to speak. And then they have to be able to recover from one practice session to another. That's work capacity to me. I also think in the training, whether they have a home gym, or they just have their body weight, they have to make maximal efforts, right? And they need to make maximal efforts because you need to establish some type of strength baseline because strength is the foundation from where all, the, all other physical qualities evolve and strength is important for injury prevention. We know that stronger athletes have less injuries. We know that um, uh, Tim Hewitt has done a lot of research with like ACL prevention and he'll tell you he used a term called uh, ligament dominance where weaker athletes are more dependent upon their dominant their ligaments for its joint stability versus musculature you know uh, forces and etc so we've got to establish a strength base again somehow but strength bases occur at maximal efforts and so things that I think of are um, you know, I'm a big advocate of squatting. So even if it's body weight squatting, you have to achieve certain depths because lower depths give you greater EMG contribution of musculature. Um, I would do maximum velocity movements like jumping up stairwells, stopping, jumping up a staircase, right? You have a maximum effort, but because if you're stuck at home, because each step is at a different height than the level you're jumping from, impact forces are less. I would sprint, you know, you and I've talked about this. You have to be concerned with concrete and asphalt, but I sprint outside because you need maximal efforts for neuromuscular timing and as such, not just strength levels and maximum efforts give you strength levels, rate of force production, all those things. So I just think you need to establish a work capacity. You need to have some kind of training through some type of model of highs and lows, but I think you really need to enforce that there's gonna be periods of that training that, that require maximal efforts. And then once practice or sports practice are resumed, and that's another question, you know, we're treating patient in physical therapy and medicine because it's, it's considered an essential quote unquote business. When is, when is sports and college sports considered an essential business? I don't know. But, um, you know, you just have to deal with the cards that are dealt to you. And I think that it's really work capacity, strength base, and neuromuscular timing through maximum velocities and maximum efforts because things change with load and velocity. And, and I don't have all the answers, but that's how I look at it. Yeah, well, I think there's one piece, and I'm going to get Omar Sanchez to jump in because he brought up a very good point. Um, this idea that, you know, okay, we're going to control what we can on the uh, the training side, but certainly, um, should we be pushing administrators or even leagues to say like, hey, we need this much time because time is going to be the the real limiting factor here. So if I say you have two weeks to do group training or whatever, team training, and then we start practice? Or will it just be, we just start practice? So even, a, even advocating for that time is going to be important. And can we do that? Uh, Omar, what, what are your thoughts on that? You want to bring everybody on the same page, but how do we do that? Yeah, I, I think it's important to, uh, I, was a, I was an associate AD, and I've been a basketball co about college basketball coach for 10 years. So I've carried those different hats. And uh, I think athletic trainers and strength conditioning people need to really meet and educate the administrators uh, if they're not educated about return to play and what's important and what's in the best interest of, 
of the student athlete because obviously uh, if, if you don't do that correctly, you're going to have a lot of injuries and uh, it's going to look a lot different. And more importantly, it's, it's you know, uh, what the student athlete is surrounded with nowadays, the different types of pressures of, you know, friends and family and, and maybe some of those influencing some of those student athletes to, to maybe, you know, maximize this opportunity as, hey, go harder than someone else and not really having that science behind return to play and what that looks like. But I do believe education and really preparing your administrators to really know what that looks like and, and creating a time frame that paints a picture for them that hopefully they get on board with. Yeah, that, that's going to be huge because, again, if everybody's left to their own devices, as we've seen with even the distancing, it doesn't always work well and, it, and there's going to be casualties. So, yeah, that, that's great to hear from you as a sport coach and administrator as well. Uh, I'm going to get Devin Kell to get in here, and he's on the strength and conditioning side at a call at the university. Um, and what are, what are you going to do as far as, you know, obviously you're prepping on the training side, but are you communicating right now with other staff and saying, like, we need this much time to really consolidate any training before we return. Um, I agree with Robert. Uh, as far as the training, be focusing on speed and plyometrics and stuff like that, people who are focusing on that are going to be way ahead of the game. Um, in reference to one of your articles I read recently, Derek, on convincing sport coaches to let you do proper speed training with the amount of rest time has been a lot easier now that we have so much time. So that's been important. Um, but what I think is going to happen as far as return to play, I think coaches are going to get them day one. We're not going to have, you know, any summer training at all. So I think it's going to come up to, you know, how much respect does your football coach have for your strength conditioning program and how much uh, trust do they have that they're going to let you just take their athletes and keep them out of practice for a while and get them back going first before we put them into practice. Um, as far as contact sports, I think you'll see a lot of sport coaches not you know, using all of their full contact practices, there's, you know, there's a certain amount they can use. And I think they're going to back off on that. Um, I think the reduction of the season, there's going to be less games as far as, you know, not playing non-conference games to save money. I think that's going to be very helpful as well. So just trusting uh, your strength and conditioning coach. And then you also referenced GPS earlier. Um, this bigger schools that have catapult and things like that, I think gathering data on that uh, is going to be important, you know, kind of quantifying that and seeing if there is a number where we have to, you know, fall back from it as far as return to play before this, all this happens and not with all the detraining, what's going to happen after that. Now, do you, do you now uh, this idea of like trusting between the coaches, do you think it's, it's necessary now to broach that topic with the coaches and put that out there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're having our zoom meetings within our staff talking to our coaches. Um, as far as right now, they're uh, as far as like, accountability as far as training we're not allowed to you know hold people accountable all of these workouts are voluntary um so kind of making our way through that and then when we get back to season um yeah your your trust your coach has to trust you and give you the proper time to get these kids back ready to go before our season starts um and we're you know we have pretty good trust with our coaches now so i think we'll have a good situation when we return I mean, that's a good point. Like, I mean, maybe this is the time and Omar, you want to jump back in here. Like, is this the time to re reestablishing those connections and, and building that trust and having constant talks over the next few weeks? Cause I guess we have time. It's easier to schedule. Is that something that, that you're involved in as well as building that trust amongst staff and coaches? And Yeah. You know, um, uh, Matthew Schaefer is uh, currently the strength coach, um, at Holy names. I was the director of strength conditioning there. I am no longer with the university, but uh, I know a lot of the things that they're doing is kind of those Zoom meetings. And like I said, uh, even within the staff, uh, Devin hit it dead on, is really uh, having those meetings with those coaches to really understand that return to play is going to look a lot different. And uh, I know at the D2 level where we're at, uh, and even maybe D3, and someone mentioned NAIA, uh, if they have those amount of resources to have strength coaches, I mean, you're really going to have to educate coaches because I think sometimes coaches uh, obviously want to win, uh, but you're not going to be able to win if your top three players are injured with hamstring injuries or pulled a muscle or whatever. And so I, I think educating them. And right now, because we have the time, it is so vital to get everyone on the same page so that when, when your student athletes, when that time comes, um, 
that you're on the same page as far as what you're going to do and they're going to be aware of what you're going to do so that it can be rolled out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Like if, you know, hopefully those relationships are intact and people are thinking about that because as you know, every sports coach that we're involved in wants to get their technical tactical and skill stuff in as quickly as possible and they can't get enough. So, so definitely. Um, uh, ben Hoffman, did you want to jump in and just talk about, you know, the situation with, with your university and how you guys are, you know, meeting and talking and, and trying to get everybody on, on, on the same page, especially the sport coaches? Um, yeah, sure. So I think the conversations probably aren't quite there how they should be yet. Um, I have started talking with our men's soccer athletic trainer, trying to get a, get a plan of what we're going to do and kind of present that to coaches. But um, it's tough with a not knowing when we might come back because that's, that's the hardest thing. Like when, when do we get back? When do we have these guys ready to go? Um, I can look at GPS numbers all day long and kind of plan backwards and have ideas in my head on how we do that. But when we don't know when, when they come in, when, uh, when uh, we can, start that planning, how many players are going to be ready to go. I think it's pretty tough. Uh, so those are the kind of things we're starting to think about. And um, I know the coaches, that's one thing I, I worry about is our coaches, even on a normal year, we jump right into two a days and things are, it's a crazy spike already. So I'm even more, more worried about it now with this time of even more detraining. And then are they going to want to just hit the ground running and going? So I think like some of the other guys have, have touched on those conversations need to be had and how we can, how we can kind of mitigate some of those problems. Um, and I think just, like I said, having those conversations needs to happen. I haven't had a whole lot of them just yet. Um, I think it's good that you guys bring that up, but I don't know. I think as soon as we, as soon as we have kind of a clear, clear path to where it ends then maybe we can start solidifying some of those a little bit better and those conversations will be easier um, but the more power they can give strength and conditioning sports medicine to have a bigger say in that I think the easier it'll be and like Omar said getting everybody on the same page is is kind of the biggest biggest part of it yeah no I I, I appreciate uh, your your contributions, but definitely Omar. Um, Keenan was contacting me offline. I'll get Keenan to speak next. He's like, how do you find these people? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just lucky that people want to join the conversation and they're knowledgeable. So it's a bit of hit and miss, but but certainly we we benefited from a lot of people just jumping on. Uh, Keenan, as far as this idea of building this relationship with your staff, maybe even more resilient than it was before in this communication. Um, is that what's something you're working on right now is just making sure everybody is on the same page? And do you have outreach to even say colleges, university swim programs? And are they part of that discussion is, you know, how as a sport, are we gonna come together and make this work for our sport at the very least? Yeah, I think, uh, I think what we'll do is, is take a 30,000 foot view and present our detraining, cross training, re return to training, to all our, our national team coaches, and most of them are employed by, by the university setting, really like two key coaches are, are not NC2A coaches. And so kind of get the information into their hands, get their feedback on, okay, well, what does this mean for this situation, this scenario, then present it to our national team athletes, which is about 150 or so athletes, get their feedback. And then really like the, the, the challenge will come exactly how you're talking is, is you know, most of our, our athletes train at NC2A places, whether or not their eligibility is exhausted or not. And that's really where, even before COVID, the communication really, really struggled. So um, that's, that's going to be a challenge in terms of the team physician saying, well, that's, that's great. This NGB has, has come down with that, but, but I'm a doctor. So uh, I got to answer to the provost, the president, what have you. Um, so hopefully the, the, the hope would be that through all this, regardless of sport, right, that the communication collaboration, um, first and foremost is, is student athlete health and well-being, then the general population, uh, like their health and well-being, right? Like 
the universities are kind of in a catch 22. They, they need, you know, like they need 104,000 people to come watch football five times a week or five times a season to, to, to generate basically the athletic department for, for a year and then bowl games on top of that. But is there, is there a logical uh, rationale that, that administrators and health administrators can come together and say, like, it's just not, it's just not wise. It's not healthy. It's a public health concern to pack people into these stadiums. What does it look like in terms of, man, uh, can we charge a high amount for quality premium seating for say 150 people to come watch live and sit around? Uh, and then Big Ten Network, Big 12, well, it's Texas, like Texas has their own network and Notre Dame essentially has NBC, right? Like, how can we, how can we share, how can the big universities, how can uh, the school in Columbus and Michigan um, share their funds with, with the smaller schools, so the Iowas, um, for maybe a year or two to get, you know, kind of get everybody on a financial, every athletic department on a financial um, kind of even playing field and then open back up when, whenever this, whether it's two years, when it's more logical to, to travel and have people in stadiums. So it's I kind of took it from the, like you said, the sport of swimming and kind of made it a bigger, a bigger, maybe a bigger health picture that can stimulate better conversation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I wanted to get Rob to jump in on that too. Rob had his hand up. Rob, uh, you want to continue along what Keenan was saying? Yeah, I just have a question and, and you know, Listen, I was a Division One strength coach for 10 years, and I understand the difficulty of dealing with coaches at times. I just have a question for the strength coaches or anybody dealing, dealing in a Division One environment right now or a college environment and maybe even the pros. This, this virus has created a situation that's never been precedented, and it's a time where people have really come together. Like in our own business, we – we knew when we had to shut our performance center and we knew when we had to make modifications through discussion of how to treat patients in our physical therapy product line, so to speak. Are coaches really going to be that difficult at this point in time to not sit down with their medical staff and their strength and conditioning staff and say, when we return, how are we going to redress this return? I mean, is that, is that really... And that's a question I have. That's why I had my hand up. Do you really feel that that's going to be a difficult process to occur? A coach is really not knowing, have ever been through this before, not willing to listen to their staff altogether? And I'm, I'm truly asking that as I'm not a strength coach right now anymore at a Division One university. So I'm just throwing that out there, what people think. Because to me, you, everybody's got to come together and figure this out at your own institution. How are we going to attack this moving forward and is it whether it's a business a hospital or or a sports team or an entity to you know to not do that just is so illogical to me because yeah, everybody's I, doing it i would i would i i mean my opinion is that you're gonna have to force this through medical staff even if you're the strength coach you go to the at and you get on board and get the doctors involved and say like this has to be done but i'll, I'll get ryan to jump in i want everybody to speak here i'm I'm on the low man on the totem pole here. So when we look at the nature of human interaction between leadership and power, you know, I would assume that, you know, when answering specifically Rob's question, the best coaches do listen to their assistant coaches, contemplate, take the information in, ponder as long as they can without cut, undercutting their program, then make a decision and explain why they took the advice that they took or to explain why they did not, you know, all coaches along that paradigm, you know, there's, it, it, you know, it floats depending on how you look at, but typically your best coaches are the ones that are going to listen to their staff, going to respect their staff and trust them because you need those trusted voices in on your coaching staff in order to get stuff done and to improve and to better facilitate your athletes and your productivity as a program. If you don't, you're, you're a, you know, a captain without a rudder, you know, you're, you've got your hands on the wheel, but the boat isn't necessarily going where it needs to go. And so it takes a while for some coaches to, to figure that out. For me, I mean, I'm a high school coach, but, you know, I interact with eight different coaches, my staff or on the boys staff that we have to coordinate with. And for a long time, you know, I thought I knew everything and it took me about five years to figure out 
I knew nothing, you know, and one of the biggest things that it figure out was I need to hire staff that I respect, that I trust, that will give me constructive criticism so that we can get better. And at times I'm going to listen, at times I'm not. What I hate is having a coach that would be very frustrated or upset with the situation that we're doing, you know, and then never say anything until the end of the year. I feel like that's missed opportunity. Now, talking about things that we also can do besides kind of getting a developed sense of what we would like our program to look like coming back because of the situation that we've just had for however many months this is going to go on. The other thing I think that needs to be done is that a head coach would need to push upon his assistant coaches to do a lot of digital um, professional development. So like getting on the Altus website, getting on USATF, getting those uh, IAAF or whatever they call themselves now, those certifications. Uh, one of the things I do amongst my coaching staff and with my friends is we have a book club and the book club that we're doing for this particular year is based on leadership in big programs. And so like right now, everybody that's in my book club is reading the book Legacy, which is of course about the all blacks of New Zealand. And those are things that I feel like people should be doing in order to enhance their craft as we move forward. I also think that as a coaching staff, your upcoming leaders that you are going to have, whether you have those seniors that are returning or your rising juniors moving in or people that are going to become captains that are veterans in a pro program, you need to be darn well clear and sure with those particular athletes of what you want to look like as the season continues or restarts or gets underway and what they expect that to look like too. Because this is a long period of time and they spend way more time with their friends and colleagues than they do with coaching training staff in this type of situation. So there's a lot of conversations and things that are going to need to be hashed out and kind of aired out and let breathe because of the time that we've had apart. There's going to be some things that are going to need to be discussed. Yeah, communication and, and education. And, and uh, I wanted to get Chris Roof to jump on. Uh, he had mentioned about, um, you know, some coaches will just do what they feel is necessary for them to do. Chris, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, and I don't think it, in, in some instances, it'll be, it won't be from a malicious standpoint, right? They just, some, I think some coaches will, will maybe naively think that everybody that's, that's out now away from schools is able to train at the level that they need to be able to, to be ready. Um, and it's, you've, you've heard in talks with, with other performance professionals and, and whatnot, you heard this big concern when all this started going down, the concern was, well, how are we going to keep the kids accountable while they're home? So that was, that should really be the least of your worries right now. I mean, you should be more concerned about, you know, what, what might be going on at that kid's home from a family members being sick or loved ones being sick or family members losing jobs, things like that. Um, so everybody was worried about this accountability piece. Like there's, you're going to get, if you have a football team, you're going to get a hundred guys with a hundred different situations coming back. Some that were able to train pretty effectively for the most part, some that chose not to, and some that just flat out couldn't because of whatever their situation wouldn't be. And, and there's got to be some flexibility for all that. And, there, and there's going to be some coaches that are going to think that they'll, they'll be able to come back ready to go. And that's, that's naive. Um, there's going to be a, a, a mental and a mental health component to the return. Also, uh, you go from being in this so, socially, socially isolated environment to now getting back together with everybody that, that, uh, you know, you think you miss. So there's going to be some people in that group that you don't like and, and you get reminded that you don't like them or, you know, it's going to take some time to gel and get cohesive. And then I think the other point is, is a few people have mentioned getting trust between the strength conditioning coach and the head coach. If, if we're just looking at this as a strength coach and head coach uh, issue or thing to work on, uh, I think we're looking at the wrong, looking through the wrong lens. Everybody's got to be involved with this. Sport coaches, administrators, sports medicine, athletic performance professionals. If everybody is not bought into this, it's not going to work. You have to have backing from admin. You have to be able to educate them on why this is important. And if you have a good administrators, they're, they're already thinking about this. And, and it's their, the care of the student athlete is important to them. Um, and everybody needs to be collaborating on this and should be 
we don't know the timeline. It's, it's way out there. It could change. It changes every day. So um, we could have a, a deal where, yeah, okay, you're back on campus August 1st. We're playing football games, volleyball games in three weeks. Uh, go. And everybody's got to be able to prepare for that scenario and do that ahead of time and not wait till the last minute to do it or wait for somebody else to tell them what they should be doing. Now, Chris, um, let's assume that, and again, you, you don't have uh, an administrator who's leading from the front and who's not getting into these conversations right now. As a performance person, um, do you, again, do you force that conversation? Do you start bringing that up? Do you feel confident? Um, and I, I'm not speaking specifically about your situation, but would somebody in a strength and conditioning role feel confident to reach out and say, hey, guys, have you thought of this? Can we start talking about this? They, they need to be, they need to be, but they also need to be able to speak the language of the sport coach when they're, when they're doing that or the administrator. Um, it's, yeah, we can, we can rush and, and fast cook the process and have 75% of the team ready to go in two or three weeks and 25% of the team in the training room for a month after that, or we can play the long money and make sure that we've got our bodies available as we get deeper into the season because we weren't over aggressive with what we did early on. And they just need to be able to communicate that in a way that the coach can understand. And it may, it's not, it may not happen in just one conversation. They've got to be able to slowly chip away with that and, and uh, build some rapport with the coach among this situation. Yeah, good points. Thank you for that, Chris. I wanted to get uh, Ken Vick to jump back in. Just because, Ken, we're talking about this communication, communicating with the coaches as a private sector person, um, if you're dealing with athletes who are going back to a pro team or to a college, do you feel that you have the, um, you know, a trust or this, this ability, confidence that you can influence and you maybe talk, reach out to some of these organizations and say, hey, this is where I've got the athlete to, you know, I don't know if everybody on your team is going to be at that level or these are the boxes I've tick, ticked off. Do you have that level of communication with some of the, uh, um, the people you're working with and, and who, where they're going back to? Yeah, it's uh, it's mixed. It's really mixed. Um, so obviously, I mean, I think it echoes what everybody says. It's all about relationships and leadership, right? Are you communicating well? Do you have relationships? Uh, we've said this before. If you've waited till now to start building relationships, you're you're, you're in deep shit. So, um, so yeah. In some cases, you know, our top coaches can reach out to the people they know at a college, un a university, at a pro team, and have communication. Uh, that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, in other cases, though, because we're private, we're dealing with a couple things. One, we're dealing with athletes. So on the elite athlete side, um, there's athletes that are looking at how do they get an edge right now. If they're at the top of their game, they're a veteran, they're in the league or something, you know, they're not. But we have those other athletes who are just below that, who are trying to make now with more time an Olympic team. Um, we have athletes that are trying to compete at that international level. And some of those are looking at this, and I can tell you from some things that I've heard and known, there's athletes looking at this as an opportunity to cheat uh, on the elite level. There's uh, doping that's gonna go on during this period because of stuff, and that's a whole nother conversation, but, but it highlights what happens with athletes. They look for edges, especially those that are not secure. Uh, and I say the same for teams. Teams, programs, clubs that are not secure will look to use this to get an edge. Um, because they have less to lose. And so we're trying to counsel individual athletes. Uh, a lot of our centers in the U.S., they're trying to work with their local uh, clubs. I mean, you want to talk about places that get out of control. Um, they don't have the restrictions in the private side in sports clubs. At least in universities, you have different levels of oversight. A private sports club, there's no medical, there's no oversight. Um, they have individual coaches doing stuff and they're going to move up their tryouts over this team so that they can get the best players and get the money and revenue. They're going to try to do things that way. And that's where we have some really, con really big concerns because we've already seen it. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we've made a little note of and I was making notes myself right now is how do we get ahead of that curve same way? How do we hopefully help educate them? Uh, it's going to be in their best interest to build up properly it's going to be in their best interest to do some smart things but yeah unfortunately rob i think i think there's going to be a lot of coaches and people who listen more and are smart uh but those that are insecure or those that don't have as much to lose are going to do some stupid things yeah rob did you want to connect on that 
Yeah, I, I just, I just would not. You know, I know everything's not logical. I just think that you're in a you're in a situation now. Like you know, just off the top of my head, I would think, look, people are coming back. They're going to be probably. As someone pointed out, I was reading the chat. They may be hesitant to uh, participate as they would because if I get too close to somebody, am I going to get this virus? I mean, there's going to be a psychological aspect that maybe a lot of people haven't thought about. But I just, I just think if you sat down with a coach and said, look, usually. I'll throw it in. Ten percent of the practice is dedicated to conditioning. Give me three weeks. You know, maybe you don't have three weeks. So twenty-five percent of the practice will be dedicated to conditioning week one. Twenty percent week two. Fifteen percent week three, and then week four everything's as normal. And so, coach, at least you know you have your players on the field instead of in the training room hurt, right? Those types of discussions are the discussions I'm, I'm speaking about where a coach previously would no way in, in his mind ever give you 25% of practice for conditioning prior to this coronavirus incident. And I think those are the types of conversation, whether people agree or not, you know, have to be, have to be had just regards to, you know, what's, what's, what's best for the athlete overall, which you know, as they say, you know, what's best of the individual because the individual's the team, but, you know, the team can't do anything without their individuals. And so, I don't know. I just think that you're in, un you're in uncharted territory here and there's conversations that have to be had and things that have to be considered that, have, you know, it's not, it's not a normal situation. I just, I, I guess, tell you from a business perspective, and I'm, I'm sure Ken and others would, would tell you the same, that you're having conversations and going through situations that either you've, you've never experienced and probably never dreamed of experience. So why would a head coach bringing his or her team back to day one sport practice, not look at it the same way? I just, I find that illogical though. Maybe I'm being very naive. I don't know, but I've been where, you know, those things have changed since the decades because I've, I've been in the, those shoes and I understand there are coaches with different personalities, different egos, et cetera. But this isn't about that right now. This is about bringing people back, making it work and, and still being successful as a team. And I just, I would find it, um, I can't, I can't think of the word, but it doesn't make sense to me that if, if a coach wouldn't sit down with his staff and try to draw out a plan altogether, relying on the expertise of the different departments that they have to put this plan together. It makes no sense to me at all not to do that as someone who, who's in a business entity. You know, we, we go through it all the time. I have a physical therapy facility. We have to treat athletes. How am I coordinating my department to get me the masks and the gloves and the sterilizing equipment that I need? How am I reaching out to the physicians and the hospitals to still let them know I'm open for business? What are the protocols I'm going to use now with a non you know, that, that a population is totally different psychologically and everything else versus a year ago? And who the, you know, I have all these departments. I have all these people I work with. Why would I not listen to their expertise to put together a plan of action to provide the care and the, the ethical reason why I went into a healthcare business, right? Take care of people and make this business survive. Why would I not do this at an institutional entity saying, well, my teams come back. This is what's best for our athletes and as well ensure that we're going to be successful. And, you know, again, yeah. I don't know. That's why I asked the question. I mean, how, it's how it's a not have those meetings. I don't it's understand. a fair question, but even at the federal government level, this isn't happening. So then you have to start drawing the conclusions that this isn't going to happen. So we have to do, we have to take it upon ourselves, right? Like it's it's crazy. It is it is kind of a weird time. Brian Miller, I wanted to let you speak. Um, you know, maybe you don't have to speak on behalf of the Navy, but certainly there's a lot of stuff going on around communication that maybe we should uh, you know emphasize now so yeah that that, that was a, a loaded statement there Derek. Um, <laughs> as far as uh how we are addressing this as a football staff we are having these conversations that that rob brought up we are answering these questions that rob brought up so i feel confident what we're doing here 
my concern is because you know we're not a power five school and i look at these other power five schools that are in the media and i have concerns about how they they are handling this because i think they are they're doing everything uh publicly trying to be accurate only to get the answer of when can we start that's that's all they want to do is they want to find that out so they're going to do everything right to get that answer then when do we start and then i think the ego that again that rod brought up that coaches have they're not really going to be able to to uh, avoid that and these football coaches in a normal year they already know football drives all these athletic departments and now they know that football is going to drive the entire ncaa at least until the basketball season starts so there's already coaches who are viewing this as you know it, you know these athletic departments are athletic departments of one to maybe two sports and that's football and basketball and the other thing i'm seeing with the, the bigger programs is just like before everyone is trying to find loopholes and that's going to keep coming up so even when all of these uh, re return to, to play processes by the ncaa come out these big programs, my concern is they're gonna keep trying to find loopholes to it. And the NCAA won't have the speed to answer all these questions and come up with the right answers. Or let alone monitor it, right? Correct, absolutely. They, they will not be able to keep up the pace to be able to do that ethically. Yeah, great points there, Brian. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, it's, it's, you know, like maybe unethically I'm doing that too because I'm trying to uh, build up my son, he's 15 year old. 15 year old and I'm trying to make him as strong as fast as he can now. And so he'll destroy people when he goes back because they're not <laughs> training. Right. So maybe I'm being unethical. I don't know, but we're, we're getting his bench and his power clean up like gangbusters. So anyways, um, I want Tyrone edge to, to kind of finish off here. He, he does a speed summit and he's been doing it for years. So he's kind of ahead of the curve in terms of the online education. But would you uh, say that, you know, this is something that you're going to emphasize in the next iteration. You've delayed it a bit, Tyrone, but uh, what are you going to talk about? Are you going to kind of change the conversation now that we're, you know, in this situation and you have this opportunity to reach a lot of people? What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so this is a great point. And um, I think that one reason, okay, because the thing, the, the pandemic's been hitting people at different rates in different places, I felt that it was like not a good idea to like go forward with whatever we had scheduled. And the other thing is because we do record the content, a lot of it, um, that a lot of the content would not be speaking to the current time. Right. And that's not fair either. Um, if we have access to some great minds, which we do, I'm very lucky to say like yourself and, and many others, um, then it behooves us to like put out content that is, uh, at least I'd say at least 25 to 30% of it's got to address the current, scenario and how to move forward intelligently right and not not just how to move forward intelligently and there have been a lot of great points brought up here by for example chris roof um clearly somebody i'm not familiar with you chris but you're clearly somebody who has a lot of those really critical communication skills that um programs are going to be realizing that are incredibly important you know going forward because you have to think outside the box You've got to be able to be nimble. You have to be pulling ideas from from different sports, from different con from different uh, you know parts of the athletic universe. You cannot be just focused on your own narrow uh, little corner of the universe. You've got to be pulling ideas from everywhere. And um, I think um, you know one of the people we'll have coming back, is, uh, David Epstein. He you know he recently wrote a book, kind of talking about like this idea of range, right, and how um, spe over special or being over kind of, uh, overly specific is kind of overrated, generally speaking, when it comes to solving new problems and like highly recommend his book. Um, but he speaks about this very eloquently. If you're just looking at your narrow range of the universe, you're generally not the person who can solve the really big problems. Uh, what you generally find is people who are pulling ideas from outside are the ones who are going to be able to pull you know, solutions that are going to bring people forward in an important way, right? So if you look at, for example, even in track and field, you look at some of the best coaches in history. Um, you know, Lauren Seagrave was a chef. Um, Charlie Francis had a history and political science degree. Um, these people were not PhDs in sports science, you know what I mean? Like, 
you've got to have people who are like worldly, who are constantly pulling new concepts from everywhere. Um, and I think that like really pushing that idea that being a really good communicator and an, and a synthesizer, I think that's what's needed in the 21st century. And going forward with coaching education, I think that online, this is the way I see it playing out, is that I think we'll get better at raising the baseline of uh, intelligence of the coach by sharing a lot more of the baseline, like good information online. So instead of going to a big conference where, you know, everyone's doing PowerPoints and there's 200 people there, what we'll have is a highly educated population. We'll have smaller groups meeting with their, whoever it is that their guru of choice is, the person they choose to follow. Uh, and that person in a smaller group of maybe six to 12 people will be able to have much higher level discussions, you know, at a higher price point, obviously, because it's a smaller group. But I think that we'll be able to have higher level discussions. Everyone will be on, a, will have a common language that they're able to speak. And we won't be kind of like doing this kind of low level introducing like of various topics in larger settings, if that makes sense. So that's where I see online education going over the next few years. Um, that's just my take and maybe others see it differently. But the one other thing I wanted to talk about is, um, is this, this opportunity for those of you who are here, you're obviously like very interested, very, you know, good thinkers. There's a real opportunity to influence, uh, even if you're a new coach in a new setting, in a new school and at a low level, just making yourself available as a resource, uh, creating like, not going in and, and saying, hey coach, you know, how can I help? But maybe coming up with some concepts that you can pitch in a non-offensive manner, um, you know, that could be solution oriented, you know, to deal with some of these issues that you feel that your, your teams are going to have. And like, like many of the speakers said already here, uh, I think those, the, the better coaches are going to be looking to pull those resources right now. And if you are one of the people who are stepping forward and providing solutions, even if they're not perfect, you are going to increase your influence in that uh, space and you're going to be a, a better resource for everyone around uh, to come to you when they have a question and like for you to be able to share and like, you know, try and push the whole, um, you know, the, the success of the organization forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tyrone. That was a good way to wrap things up. And, and hopefully when you do launch your speed summit this year, we'll, we'll have everybody, on and, and, and taking advantage of that and also speaking to that, that idea that we have to be better at filling in the gaps in education and making people better generalists. Um, what I wanted to say to finish here was that maybe one of the things you could do is even just share this conversation. So I'll make it available. But I thought this was really good. I'm very appreciative of everybody who jumped on. Uh, just great information. And it, that speaks to kind of your thoughtfulness around this topic and, and how you care about athletes and, and the people you work with. So thank you very much. I, I want to continue this next week as well. And, and I'm sure there'll be more to talk about. And I just want to make sure everybody stays safe and, um, you know, keeps sharing the knowledge. So that was great. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend and happy Easter. Um, you know, hopefully you find some good Easter eggs uh, tomorrow. So thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone.